Well, good morning, and welcome to worship at Laverne Christian Reformed Church this morning. We are glad you are here. Welcome to all guests and visitors and, and family as uh, we are invited to celebrate with Don and Marcia today. After the service, they'll be serving cake for their 50th wedding anniversary for this coming week, and so you're invited to stay in fellowship uh, afterwards for that. And just one other note from uh, the bulletin, uh, received word from a former member here who you have sent off into ministry at Colton, uh, CR, at the CRC there. Sam is, has opportunity to go to Peru to visit where uh, a place that's near and dear to his heart where he spent some time as a teenager and uh, they invited him down there to preach in Peru and there's a fundraising event on June 16 and a poster uh, in the back on the bulletin board with some more info about that event as well. But uh, keep Sam in your prayers and uh, we're happy for him in this opportunity. And we are also blessed in the opportunity to worship together this morning our triune God and great creator who calls us with his word from Genesis 1-1 and Colossians 1, verses 16 through 17. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and he holds all things together. May all creation bow before him in humble adoration and worship this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We owe our very existence to your gracious hand. Extend your grace to us again, we pray. Be near to us. Assist us in our worship, that through the power of your Spirit, we would glorify you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our praise of singing together the hymn, Holy, 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 found in Psalter, hymnal 318. Let's sing this hymn of praise together.
in our holy and triune God greets us as we gather in his name with these words, may grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. And all God's people said, amen. As God has greeted us, let's take a moment to greet one another. And we continue our praise together with the hymn, Let All Things Now Living. Normally in this time of worship, we take the opportunity to hear a call to confession and God's assurance of forgiveness and his will for our lives, but that will take form in the prep- preparation for meeting at the Lord's table next week, which too calls us to examine ourselves and to return again to Christ seeking his forgiveness and seeking it through these signs and seals that we will share together in the bread and the cup, being reminded of what he has done for us and for our sins. And so I invite you, if you want to read along in the back of the Songs of Praise, number 142, we'll just read the preparatory portion here as we look towards communion next week. And so, beloved in Jesus Christ, Since we hope next Lord's Day to celebrate the blessed sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we're called to prepare our hearts by rightly examining ourselves, for the Apostle Paul has written, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. 1 Corinthians 11. Let all of us then examine our lives and considering our own sin, the wrath of God on it, be sure that we humble ourselves in repentance before God. Let us examine our hearts to be sure that we trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation 
and that we believe our sins are forgiven wholly by grace for the sake of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. And finally, let us examine our consciences to be sure that we resolve to live in faith, in obedience before our Lord, and in love and peace with our neighbors. So those three calls to examine our lives, our hearts, and our consciences. And it says, God will surely receive at the table his son all who truly repent of their sins. Believe in Jesus Christ as their savior and desire to do his will. All those, however, who do not repent, who do not put their trust in the Lord Jesus, and who have no desire to lead a godly life, are warned according to the command of God to keep themselves from the holy sacrament. If we're living in disobedience to Christ and in enmity with our neighbors, we must repent of our sin and reconcile ourselves to our neighbors before we come to the Lord's table. For if we partake of the sacrament in unbelief and willful disobedience, we eat and drink judgment to ourselves. The solemn warning is not designed, however, to discourage penitent sinners from coming to the holy sacrament. We do not come to the supper as though we were righteous in ourselves, but rather to testify that we are sinners and we look to Jesus Christ for our salvation. Although we do not have perfect faith and do not serve and love God with all our hearts, and though we do not love our neighbors as we ought, we are confident that the Savior accepts us at his table when we come in humble faith with sorrow for our sins and with a will to follow him as he commands. Since it's necessary for us to come in the sacrament in good conscience, we urge any who lack this confidence to seek from the minister or any elder of this church such counsel as may quiet their consciences or lead to conversion of their lives. And all then who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who earnestly desire to leave a godly life, ought to accept the invitation now given and come with gladness to the table of their Lord. That we may rightly examine ourselves before God, let us seek his gracious help through prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given us the gospel of Jesus Christ, that good news, and who has provided a most wonderful communion with him through the mystery of the sacrament, we ask for your grace to enable us to prepare our hearts to receive holy communion. And to all who sincerely believe in your Son and truly repent of their sins, grant assurance of your gracious readiness to receive and bless them in the supper of their Lord. To all who have not repented and have not put their trust in the Lord Jesus, Grant a restraining fear of the supper, lest their condemnation be greater. But have mercy upon these and grant them grace to repent of their sins and seek their salvation in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We confess, O Father, that we have offended your majesty and deserved your judgment. We have transgressed in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. We are truly weak. Be merciful, O God, and grant us your pardon. And let us come to the sacrament in joy, of your forgiving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit, one and only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. And as we reflect on preparing our our hearts, we also do so through the hymn, O Christ, our hope, our heart's desire, Psalter Hymnal 376.
And we have opportunity to go before our gracious God together in prayer. Let us go to him now together. Creator God, the Lord and King of this universe, the one who was before all things and who created all things, both visible and invisible, in heaven and in earth. Lord, you are an almighty and majestic Lord. Yet as the scriptures describe how you create all of it, it's with such ease and effortlessly, with your voice, with the, with the breath, and other parts describe you as putting it up like a tent or a builder. And we see your handiwork in the creation around us and how you continue to sustain it by your word and your providence that it continues to work all in harmony as you have created it. Yet, Lord, we know that all is not as it should be, that there has been corruption of this good world that you created through the fall and sin. And so now, Lord, we face the effects of that, and, and so the world can be a dangerous place for us. We become more aware of our weakness and frailty. We know of disease and illness and death. But Lord, we know that's not how you created it to be. And so we ask for your powerful and guiding hand for us as we navigate our lives in this world and that we may still know your power and your goodness and what you've created around us and what you have created within and how you have called us to yourself again in sweet communion with you. And so we thank you for this opportunity this morning to be reminded of your words in scripture, of your words of promise and command to us today still. And that your word still has a, a powerful effect of upholding this world and of creating new life in your people. And so that the things in the corruption and sin and death are no longer the end for us, for we have hope in your son Jesus Christ who conquered these on the cross and through his resurrection of the grave. So Lord, we adore you and thank you this morning again. And we're thankful for the ways that you have been faithful in our lives. We ask that you continue to uphold the relationships of this congregation, the between parents and children, grandparents and aunts and uncles, and also between husbands and wives. We rejoice with Don and Marcia as they look to celebrate their 50th anniversary this week, Lord. May they reflect on your faithfulness in their lives, Lord. May they enjoy this, this time and this milestone of knowing how you have brought them through these years in love and in walking in step with you too, Lord, and, and making you the center of their lives. And Lord, we're thankful for all the different wedding ceremonies that can be celebrating of, of family members and connections of this congregation. We ask that you bless these marriage unions, bless them with, with love and graciousness and patience and kindness. And Lord, we pray for your healing hand for those who face struggles and illness. We pray for those that continue in, in treatments for, for cancer, Lord. We ask for your peace and your strength for Will and for Kale and for Vonda. Continue to walk alongside them, Lord, as they fight against this disease each day. 
minister to their hearts and to their souls, knowing that you are still with them. And may the treatments that they, that they receive be effective and give them strength and healing. To Lord, we pray for those who are unable to be with us, our homebound members, and uh, continue to give your blessing to them even on this Lord's Day. So we br- pray for your blessing for John and, and Mary Brands. We're thankful that John could return to be home with Mary again, and we pray that he receives the care and strength that he needs to and be with Hen- Henry and, and Betty Bauma and see even it celebrates his birthday this coming week. Lord, may that be a blessing for them. And to Lord be with Carol as she's in her home as well. May she even know your nearness, Lord. And Lord, we're thankful for those who heed your call to proclaim your gospel throughout the world and even within this nation and community. We rejoice with Pastor Sam as he has opportunity to go to Peru this summer. We're thankful with him for that, and we're thankful for the gospel work that's being done in the Peru area near the Amazon there, that there's a tribe who had a peaceful contact many years ago that they still celebrate, and now there's new churches being planted. Lord, we're thankful for the work of the light of your gospel there with those people. And Lord, we're thankful too for around this community and the work of Adam Ramirez. We pray that you continue to give him more and more connections around here to build relationships with and to spread the good news in his Spanish ministry in southwest Minnesota. Lord, we're thankful for the work of this church. May we continue to serve you faithfully and we pray too for our education fund and ways we look to raise from youth all the way through all the ages to continue to be nurtured in your word and to lean not on our own understanding but yours, your word alone. And so bless the education of this church too of which we will soon take an offering for. But Lord, in all things, may you be our lasting joy May you be our greatest reward, and may you receive all our glory and praise as our mighty creator God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Deacons will come now, and we have opportunity of giving your gifts and offerings for the education fund.
And as we prepare to hear from God's word from Genesis 1, we do so through the hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, Songs of Praise 72. Let's stand again if you're able and sing together. As we go to God's word together, let's go to him once again in prayer and ask for his guidance. O Lord, our God, who created this world by your very word, speak to us in your word this morning. May our thoughts and meditations of our hearts be honorable and glorify you. And even if this is a familiar passage to many of us, Lord, help us to hear it with open ears and open hearts and lives ready to live for you, praising you for all that you are and all that you have done. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we turn to Genesis 1 together as we'll go through the six days of creation 
after we've considered the God of the very beginning and even the work of the Spirit hovering over the earth in verse 2. Maybe this is something that we could take for granted. Maybe at one point in Sunday school you memorize the six days of creation and, and what, what happens when. And, and it's rather straightforward. It doesn't include maybe a lot of details that we would like. Yet this is indeed Scripture and part of God's Word and, and we should return to it again and again, searching it and meditating on it and researching to have it speak to us again of our God and great Creator. And even at the, at the speaks of the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word created is a unique word that's only attributed to God through the Hebrew Scriptures. It's only something that he could do. So he's distinct from the rest of this world. And as we consider this beginning of the Bible, how it lays the groundwork for the rest of the Bible, and that's why it's called the series, The Foundations of the World. Let's hear now from God's word from Genesis 1, starting at verse 3, and we'll end in the middle of day 6 at verse 25. Hear now God's word. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. God God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. God saw that it was good. And there was evening and morning the third day. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the waters teems according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill in the water and the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word this morning. And so what you believe about the origins of this world can make a world of difference. If there is no God, well, then you may just wonder how this happy accident of Mother Nature came about. If nature is God, well, then you're going to begin to worship the created things. And if nature is part of God, then you will want to be part of nature yourself so that you can be divine. Or if it's just one big cycle, 
well, then you hope that you're good enough and whoever's in charge will help you come back as something good again and, and not come back as a mosquito the next time. I mean, ask anybody on the street what they think about this world and where it came from, and you may get many types of answers. I mean, they may even believe that there is a God or supernatural power, but they say, well, I don't believe any of that Genesis stuff. I think that's all been disproven. However, beginning with God, and God as the sovereign creator, is going to shape how you view the whole purpose of the universe and how humanity fits in. I just read this past week the United States Space Agency, NASA, said that's part of their mission is to figure out where we fit in this great universe. And we'll focus more closely on the creation of mankind and next week, Lord willing. But this morning we're going to focus on God as creator and the creation that he, the work that he does here in Genesis 1 and how he reveals himself as the creator who commanded the world to, to be. And this beautiful literary structure helps us to notice that he built it with purpose and order and continues to govern and sustain it by his, his providence or how, what we believe about creation that goes hand in hand with providence, so we won't focus on that so much this morning. But believing in the almighty triune creator God of the Bible will change your worldview. Everything visible and invisible has been created by him. He's not part of this creation. We're not pantheists who believe nature is part of God, nor is creation part of his being as if this is God's body, which panentheism with an extra en in there, what they believe, these pantheists and panentheisms are religions that have existed for a long time. Nor do we believe that there is no God and this all occurred by a mere chance of happening to work so precisely altogether, something out of nothing. The Israelites too rub shoulders with polytheists and of their day who had their own origin stories. They would think that they could manipulate nature through worshiping their various gods who were part of different realms of creation. There, of course, there'd be a sun god, a sea god, a, a god of fertility, and so on and so forth. So Genesis clearly shows that there's only one god, and he is the one creator and the one in control of all things. And the creation story shows he's all-powerful, purposeful, and personal. And ultimately, it shows a personal and good God creating a world for his special creatures that he would make in his own image. In Genesis 3, 1, verses 3 through 25, we see that the conditions of 1, verse 2, are resolved. That it was dark and empty and covered with water. But here we'll see light, form, separation, and the filling of the earth. And to culminate with creation of mankind at the end. So this morning we'll consider these three points of God speaking, separating, and filling. First, God speaking. This divine voice command. Last time in Genesis 1-2, we considered how the Spirit was hovering over the earth and anticipating this word of God. And it would spring everything into action. The scene is about to be set but it doesn't begin until the director shouts, action. In Genesis 1, we see this beautiful orchestration of the world that springs to life by the word of God. It's highly significant that this first action in creation in verse 3 is God speaking and God set. Those three words set the rhythm of creation and is repeated ten times in this first chapter. And God said, and God said. And unlike the other pagan origin stories of Israel's day, there's no struggle with chaos. There's no just divine spark that remains in the world after it struggles to come to be. And unlike today's pagan origin stories, there's no mysterious accident that just happens to put this all in motion. No, God wills it. He determines all there is and will be by his command. And we see God's majestic sovereignty over this universe in the creation account. 
There's nothing out of his control. And his first line of action is creating light. He did, he did not need the light, but his creatures would. And he creates light itself at the very beginning. And even how this is ordered would have been an indictment against those other nations that would worship the sun and the moon and the stars. For they say, well, no, Israel, our God, he's the creator of light. These, the sun is just a source of light. He created that too, but he created light itself, the very essence I mean, just as if there is the reality of sound before the invention of a musical instrument that produces that sound. And so too there's light created before the things we know as sources of light today. And that light then would serve as a spotlight on God's work in creation. It wasn't doing work in the dark or in the secret, but all in the daylight. So all creation would take place in the light of God's revelation. God would set the pace then of the regular pattern for mankind, a day and a night, a time cycle of work, of, of work and pause, work and rest, evening and morning, working in light and resting at night. I mean, even if you work third shift and this gets flipped around, you still have a pattern of working and resting. And of course, God could have done this all in an instant and chosen a number of many ways to bring creation about but in Genesis 1, he models the time for his creatures. That it wouldn't just be about pendulums and sundials or stopwatches. That's not the important part of time, but the pattern of human activity, of work and rest. Psalm 104 reflects on the creation account. And in verses 20 and 23, it, ref it reflects on God making this time for man to work. It speaks about the animals that are out at night. And, and then in verse 22, it says, When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes to his work and his labor until the evening. There's the pattern of work and rest that's already established here in this first day. And he not only creates light, but he separates it from the darkness and gives them functions, as we are noting here, primarily for the benefit then of man separating, ordering, filling the whole earth for his prized creature. And just as parents didn't need a, to give their daughter a dollhouse, but you built one for your daughter so she could enjoy it and a gift for her to use. In our text, God's sovereignty is front and center again in verses four and five, declaring his creation of light as good. And then he names what he created in separating darkness and light, day and night, naming, showing his dominion by naming it. Creates, orders, names this great artist at work here in Genesis 1. And his creativity and his will will make it come about. He speaks that light shines out of darkness. And in his word we have recorded of the Bible has the same effectiveness. Just as the Spirit in the Word created light in the beginning, so also does the Spirit in the Word give light to darkened hearts through faith in Jesus Christ. So the Spirit and Word created the, the very earth itself, and it also sheds light of new life through faith. As John 1 reminds us, as John reflects on the creation account and shows us how the Word was also the Son, the Jesus Christ the Son, and he would come into this world as the Word made flesh. A world that was on its way for corruption and destruction, and God would speak again through the Word, Jesus, to redeem this world. And as we continue in our text, be reminded that God created the world good and was shaping it for humanity in Genesis 1. And so secondly, we consider separating. In this picture you see, came, they started to discover this group of stars when the Hubble uh, telescope was out and about back in the 90s and now they're getting even better imagery from the James Webb Space Telescope. There's these fascinating imagery, images of, of stars and stardust of their seeing stars being formed in a galaxy created 6,000 light years away. And it's been given the name the Pillars of Creation. And so you see a part of that picture 
on the screen here. And astronomers are optimistic that the study in this will give them more insight into the formation of new stars and, and galaxies as they see this one coming about. And so it's looking at this, it's not hard to see why they call this the pillar of creation. It might be a bit how you even imagine all of this coming about in Genesis 1, the stars and galaxies being in the outermost region of space, and here's this grouping of stars and dust that isn't finished yet and still forming and being separated into a galaxy. And many astronomers and scientists may try to use this even as a, a new way to figure out Earth's origin as well. Yet many astronomers and even some still today cannot help but to be in awe of as they see more and more detail in discoveries of our space through these powerful telescopes. One named Johannes Kepler, who was the founder of modern astronomy, said, the undevout astronomer is mad. Saying, how could you not be devout when you see such magnificent things in space? I mean, even consider the life-sustaining design of Earth itself and its solar system and how it's precisely 23 degrees, the slant that gives us our seasons. And what a minute deviation would either direction make life impossible as we know it. And then even the precise mass and distance of the moon and how that has effect on the tides if it was any different, the tides would either never come in or they would overwhelm the shore. And another astronomer named Jeffrey Marcy wrote in the Washington Post even about the marvel of our own solar system, how it's unique and it's designed to sustain life. It's like a jewel, he said. You've got to, the circular orbits, they're all in the same plane and it's perfect, it's gorgeous, it's almost uncanny how it all works together. And his comments echoed what Isaac Newton said 300 years before, how he noted our solar system, it's the most beautiful system of sun and planets and comets that could only come from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. That was said by Isaac Newton. In days one through three, God reveals his wisdom and goodness in creating divisions on earth for the benefit of his creatures. And he further accommodates it in verse 2, that, or accommodating what was seen to be a problem for creatures in verse 2, how it's without form and covered with water. And so separating the light and the darkness, setting in motion the evening and morning, day 2, God also separates the waters from the waters below to the waters above. Not only did his creatures need light for life, but they needed water to sustain life. And there'd be a, more than just water needed in lakes and streams, but water that comes from the sky, and he creates the sky and the clouds and the mist and the humidity and all that comes with that. But there's no declaration that this was good in verse 2. Some remark that God didn't even, that's a way that we see that not even God blessed Mondays. But what we see continuing on in this text is day three finishes the work that begins in day two. And then once the dry land was separated from the water, then he declares that it's good. Now there's a place for man to make a home on dry, dry ground. So day three is, day two, the blessing is withheld until day three. So then the Lord makes the earth fruitful with this dry ground we see in day three. There's vegetation, plants, and trees. And in them, it was even built that they would reproduce, yielding seed, each seed according to their kind. The earth would be in order and, and productive. And so if you plant a corn seed, you aren't going to get an apple tree. And even if we develop different types of apples and different types of corn plants, we are still starting with corn seed and apple seeds, and they don't produce one or the other. And there's order in that. And day three, then, is declared doubly good. And it's said again in verse 12, after he creates the vegetation, God saw that it was good. You'll see this mirrored in day six, where he says twice that it was good. And so there's these parallels between day one and four, 
days two and five, and days three and six. And there's a connection between these three sets of two. God would fill each one of these realms in corresponding days. And so third, we'll consider how he fills these realms, the filling. Christmas Eve, 1968. The crew of Apollo 8 came over the live broadcast of TV and radio that evening. We're now approaching lunar sunrise, and for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send you. And there's those three astronauts then would take turns reading from Genesis 1, verses 1 through 10. Apollo 8 that would orbit around the moon 20, or 10 times in 20 hours a crucial step in that Apollo space program and that mission later to land on the moon with Apollo 11, which would accomplish that. But what a sight that must have been for them to see the earth from that distance and the, and the moon up close, seeing the surface of the moon like no human had ever seen before that closely. And from that mission came one of the most famous photographs of that vantage point called Earth Rising, which you see in the picture Below. That was taken by the crew member Bill Anders on that Apollo 8 flight. There's something about the study of the universe that particularly brings a sense of awe and wonder of how it all came to be and how it all works together. And oftentimes many will point how the earth is just a speck in this grand universe. And in the scheme of things, life on earth is pretty insignificant when you consider how grand the universe is. And while it's healthy to have humility when considering a great universe, Genesis 1 paints a particularly different story or picture for us of the earth, though. It's not merely just one planet out of eight in a solar system. Genesis doesn't even start with the Milky Way and the other stars and the other billions of planets. No, as Genesis, as we've see in the last two weeks, it starts with God, but then God's activity of bringing about order in life and what brings meaning to the universe is what he does for the earth. Genesis 1 presents the earth as the jewel that, if it's not, it's, we can't think of it as the physical center of the universe, we, we know that, but we see it still as the center of God's purpose and plan for history. Days four through six, God addresses the emptiness of the world and fills it. Day one was light. Now day four are the lights in creation that would be created for this function of light upon the earth. They'd fill that empty sky and that empty outer space with the appropriate and necessary light for mankind. And they're given four functions in verses 14 through 19. They separate the day from the night, they're signs for the seasons, days, and years. Third, they're to give light upon the earth. And then fourth, to rule over the day and night. This four functions for just the lights of the creation. Not only would they give the pattern of night and day, but the sun, moon, and stars would mark out the seasons and the years. Humanity would be able to use them to mark out time and seasons with very reliability and accuracy. You can go to even ancient civilizations and see how they use the stars and the sun to mark out time and quite accurately. And the corresponding with the separating of the waters of day two, the Lord fills the waters with swimming creatures and the skies with flying creatures in day five. And so you see how day two and five correspond. And these creatures, these flying and swimming creatures, receive God's first words of blessing in creation, where he says in verse 22, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply in the earth. God's principle of life and continuation of life is built into his creatures. And you can see that every spring if you go out to a stream and you see those salmon going upstream, with all strenuous going up those ladders to spawn upstream to create the next generation of salmon. Or if you ever have come across one of those killed ear birds out in the field and all of a sudden you notice it's starting to act like its wings broken, 
and it's hobbling along and it's leading you away from the nest to keep its young protected. It's built in to protect the young and we see this in the creatures fulfilling this mandate of filling the earth with their offspring. And then day six solves the emptiness of the dry, dry land of day three. And there's creatures who eat the vegetation that's created and there's a whole host of land animals and the domestic animals, the livestock to be used by mankind and, and even all the creepy crawly things that you hope stay in their domain outside. And this would all crescendo into the creation of man and woman on day six a dwelling place of a world created as a gift for them to glorify God and to have fellowship with him. And so Genesis 1 reinforces that God is not part of creation and creation is not part of God. And the nations around Israel would have believed that all is one, similar to many Eastern religions today. Yet we see God's goodness in separating the things of the earth, giving it purpose and meaning and function. And although many today even want to break down those divisions and separations, and even John Lennon back in the 70s when he penned the anthem to a song, Imagine, sang about, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try, no hell below us, above us only sky. And this anthem of no structure, no categories, none of these orders or obligations, It's up to every individual to determine our own meaning in this world. It's even getting more difficult to tell the good guys from the bad guys in in some modern movies. Yet, as God would need to save his people after the fall, that fall of sin and corruption in the world, he would choose and separate them out from the world. Holiness means to be set apart. And as he calls them out to holiness by his word, by his word with all its claims and commands and promises, the same powerful word that separated the waters of the dry ground and the sun and the moon and the stars, that same word, he created all of these things. He ordered them and filled the earth and declared it good. And so may we praise the good God who made all of this as a theater of his glory who did not leave it for destruction, but continues to uphold it and sustain it today and then promises in the future to renew it as an everlasting home where God will be perfectly dwelling with his people once again as it's meant to be in the new heavens and the new earth. And that's as we pray, as on earth, as it is in heaven. Let's go to our God in prayer. Creator God, it is uncanny to consider how this entire universe and even this earth within it all works and you've given an abundance of life and filling of this earth with your creatures and may we see it as a theater of your glory in this coming week and all that we do. Know that you created it good. And with it, we renew, or we long for its renewal. Yet we still see your power and goodness throughout your creation, of how you've brought it about and sustain it to our day and continue to make it fruitful for us and giving us life and breath. Lord, may we continue to praise you for all of your works both in the world and in our own lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as a reflection on Genesis 1, we're going to return again to a song that was introduced a couple weeks ago to kind of make sure it stays fresh with us as we learn this song. We're going to sing Creation Sings, verses 1 through 3. Let's stand again and join our hearts and voices together.
Go now with God's blessing for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now God's people said, Amen. Thank you.